Is Sweden's largest newspaper, Dagens Nyheter, trying to silence its opponents? Or are they voicing democratically important criticism of dangerous ideological shifts in society? Opinions differ, depending on who you ask. My name is Henrik Jönsson, and I'm an independent libertarian entrepreneur and a social commentator. Recently, Peter Volodarsky, editor-in-chief at Dagens Nyheter, published an editorial headlined The Small Atrocities Will Change Sweden. In the text, Volodarsky attacks several clearly identifiable opponents without mentioning their names. This to illustrate how society gets more brutalized and why resistance is now necessary. One of the attacked was the philosopher and jack-of-all-trades Alexander Bard, who, according to Volodarsky, in light of his moral shortcomings, should not be allowed to appear on family TV shows. Where do you draw the line between reasonable criticism on one side and authoritarian moralistic attacks on the other? How do you weigh freedom of speech against combating intolerance? And what are these small atrocities that apparently are threatening Sweden. These are the issues that I will address in this week's video. If you enjoy my videos, you can support me to keep making them by using one of the payment options on the left. My YouTube channel is self-financed and would not exist without your generous support. For those of you who want to see more of my videos, you will find my Swedish channel above. All my Swedish videos are subtitled in English for your viewing pleasure. Also, do not forget to hit the subscribe button down below if you have not already done so. Furthermore, click that pesky bell icon to get possible notifications each time I publish new videos, which I do every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Central European time. Today, I will talk about newspapers, about technology, and about tolerance. Stay tuned! After the end of the Second World War, the philosopher of science Karl Popper expressed in his book The Open Society and Its Enemies the paradox of tolerance. The paradox of tolerance states that if tolerance is shown towards the intolerant, then the intolerant eventually will destroy the tolerant and tolerant society with them. Popper, therefore, argues that all intolerant movements should be illegal and, here comes the paradox, that tolerance can only be defended through intolerance towards the intolerant. The obvious difficulty lies in defining the limits for tolerance. At what point should those who defend tolerance become intolerant? The word tolerance originates from the Latin word tolerantia, which means to bear, to sustain, or even to endure. Being tolerant could be described as being able to accept the things you personally do not like. I respect that. To be clear, being a vegan, socialistic, gender theorist who hates carnivorous, rich, straight men is not tolerance. It is 100% intolerant. Being an ethnic nationalist with an antipathy towards the queer movement and fighting for an ethnically conformist nation-state that prohibits homosexuality, that is also 100% intolerant. Both of these motifs are identical when it comes to their intolerance, even if their focus is entirely different. Peter Volodarsky sees our time as more and more intolerant and refers to an old text by public service media about the strategies of the far right for bringing about social changes as an explanation for his attack on, amongst others, Alexander Bard, who commented on the situation as follows. Hey, Alexander Bard. Hey, Henrik Jönsson. Du måste använda hela ditt namn som du gör med mig. Volodarsky refererar till en SVT nyheter-text från 2018 som säger att alternativ högerns mål är att normalisera sina extrema åsikter för att förändra Sverige med en tydligt rasistisk och antisemitisk agenda. Och den normaliseringsprocessen fordrar då att det finns nyttiga idioter som upplåter sina plattformar till att lyfta fram de här åsikterna. 
Vi ska leva ett fritt och öppet Sverige. Alla måste ta debatten. Om jag debatterar med Maria Wetterstrand en dag och det blir en fantastiskt spännande diskussion om olika positioner kring klimatet och miljön. Jag debatterar med Gustav Kassestrand en annan dag och ställer hans ärke nationalism mot min egen kosmopolitanism. Alltså, det är det folk vill ha. Folk vill ha antagonismen. De vill ha de riktiga debatterna mellan lärda personer som brinner passionerat för sina idéer. Det är vad jag är för. Jag är för ett fritt, öppet Sverige där internet nu får slut de gamla medierna och istället får en mycket bredare liksom, debatt i samhället. Idag sitter du och gör en egen tv-kanal. Idag sitter jag och gör egna podcast. Vi har Twitter-konto. Vi har hundratusen följare på Twitter. Alltså, Sådana aktörer som vi idag, vår tids public intellectuals, bryr sig inte ens om att bygga vår makt utifrån en DN eller ett sydsvenska eller något sånt där, utan vi bygger den själva. Och det betyder att idag så kommer de här drevoffren som Peter Wolodarski skapar, de kommer ju ge svar på tal. Och det är inte han beredd på alls. Och det är klart att Peter Wolodarski som har gamla hela sin karriär på att vara en ung chef på DN, det är klart att han är hotad av internet. För när internet slår igenom så blir figurer som han bara andra platsfigurer. Eftersom han inte har bevisat en enda gång att han kan debattera. Kan ni själva avgöra vad som är sant och falskt när ni hör dem argumentera? Varför ska då någon överhuvudtaget tystas? According to Popper's model, you could argue that Volodarsky interprets our current time as so intolerant that becoming intolerant now constitutes essential democratic resistance. His own article ends with the words The small atrocities will fundamentally change Sweden if we don't oppose them. However, a well-documented issue concerning Popper's paradox of tolerance is that the limits regarding permissible or non-permissible intolerance remain subjective and tend to blind their own followers, as well as constantly narrowing these limits. The danger of Dagens Nyheter's more and more frequent talk about the liberal democracy instead of just plain old democracy is that ultimately they will only tolerate a democracy for liberals and eventually only for the right kind of liberals. As the world, based on this view, is perceived as more and more hostile, the ends of the resistant movement increasingly justifies its means. They do this under the pretext that this is an essential democratic resistance movement, which can both bend the truth and attempt to destroy their antagonists in the name of morality. But what subjectively can be perceived as a justified battle for a greater good might as well, from another perspective, be your very own small atrocities. When I was doing research for this video, I asked my Facebook followers for information on how Dagens Nyheter is dealing with their opponents. Never before have I been met with such a massive response to an open question like this. Several of those who commented were journalists who themselves felt treated inappropriately by the newspaper, but I also got contacted by opinion makers, politicians, lawyers and by business people. What they all had in common was that almost all of them wanted to give their information anonymously, by voice, telephone calls or by encrypted apps for chatting. This was due to fear of professional repercussions if they were to openly criticize Dagens Nyheter. The most frequently recurring criticism concerns a specific conflict that took place in 2018. The economist Tino Sanandaji had then criticized Dagens Nyheter for publishing the now infamous Sandviken report. This was a text that falsely claimed that the reception of refugees in Sandviken had generated an annual profit of half a million Swedish kronor. The text was widely circulated by several policymakers, including the then Minister of Integration, Erik Ullenhag. It is claimed that Peter Volodarsky, after being criticized, texted Sanandaji's employer, Professor Magnus Henriksson, in order to warn him of the bad publicity that would come unless they got rid of Sanandaji. Volodarsky was a former student of Henriksson at the business school, and he seems to grossly have misinterpreted his relationship with his former teacher when he put on this pressure, and it was not appreciated at all. Volodarsky denied all allegations of this, however, they are confirmed by people in direct contact with both Henriksson and Sanandaji. Later on, Dagens Nyheter 
admitted that the Sandvikan text was unscientific. Furthermore, much criticism is directed at a whole range of articles published by Dagens Nyheter during the most ruthless period of the Me Too phenomenon. These texts severely defamed the House Speaker at the time, Mr. Urban Alin. The articles accused Alin of offensive behavior, threats and of sexual harassment of employees. The Government Executive Board's independent investigation of the work environment found no indications of any harassment or any violations. The published texts were reported to the Ombudsman of the Press and reached their peak with an editorial calling Alin a power-abusing swine. In their statement, the Swedish Press Council accused Dagens Nyheter of acting unethically in publishing these texts. The list of Dagens Nyheter's resistance of intolerance runs much longer and wider and includes everything from completely made-up stories, for instance one about an allegedly racist firefighter that turned out not to exist, to fanciful conspiracy theories where ideological opponents of the paper were accused of wiretapping the Department of Foreign Affairs. In hindsight, these wild accusations and malevolent strong-arming seems to be both irresponsible and democratically counterproductive. However, in the light of Popper's paradox, they can be understood as acts of resistance towards a perceived intolerance, which justifies their means. In his editorial, Volodarsky gives examples of opinions that, according to him, would not have been permitted half a decade earlier. Five years ago, TV4 would not have allowed one of today's most popular family shows to feature a profiled participator who, among other remarkable things, participated in a talk show organized by prominent right-wing extremists. Five years ago, a leading candidate for the European Parliament would not have tried to give expressions like benevolence a negative connotation by babbling about virtue signaling. Five years ago, editorials in major newspapers in Sweden would not have dared venting annoyance of no longer being able to buy ordinary Swedish food on a late night in the city of Gävle. The fight against what Volodarsky considers to be intolerance is highlighted by the keywords in each of these quotes. Would not have allowed. Babbling about. Not have dared venting. Volodarsky is not fighting for liberal tolerance against totalitarian intolerance. This is a fight between wanting to control the public conversation rather than embracing freedom of speech. This is a fight between collectivism and individualism, or to put it simply, a fight between the old and the new. Earlier this year, the author and digital strategist Britt Staxton, in an opinion piece in the Gothenburg Post, expressed what the struggle is essentially all about. Staxton describes digital media as manipulating the public debate. Traditional media is accused of reinforcing unwanted messages without making an impact analysis. She goes on to accuse alternative media of cynically capitalizing on Holocaust deniers, on Nazis and on mass murderers? Jason, mother is talking to you! In trying to oppose this perceived brutalization of the debate climate, Staxton astonishingly finds anachronistic inspiration in a 100-year-old media strategy used against the KKK in the American South, silencing the voices of the unwanted through strategic silence. The opposition of Volodarsky and Staxton might as well be described as a eulogy over their own loss of power and influence. Because the internet exists. Strategic silence only affects the one that goes silent, since the conversation is already going on in other places. Even this small YouTube channel has currently more viewers each month than most of the editorial pages in Sweden. Suck on that! The desire to find a way where unwanted voices will not be allowed to vent their babbling implies that these perspectives either have the stronger argument or that the general public are easily manipulated idiots who need morally upstanding journalists to guide them to the correct conclusions and opinions. This clearly reveals that the fight against intolerance 
that Dagens Nyheter has been waging finally has come full circle and has become its own opposite. Even a representative of the so-called liberal democracy should know that a decentralized and opulent supply of perspectives and conversations is much preferable to a centralized and small group of journalists with the power to control the public debate. The controlled society that Dagens Nyheter has come to fight for is characterized by fear, by silence and by conformity. It is a society where no one dares to stand out for fear of being lynched. This regarding whether you call it strategic silence or a means to prevent the perceived small atrocities. Because tolerance means accepting what you personally do not like. Do you agree that a rich and unrestrained discussion is preferable to one that is restricted through strategic silence? If so, I think you should share this video with your friends. And why not subscribe to my YouTube channel? Have you experienced conflicts between old and new media? Then please share your thoughts in the comment section down below. I appreciate all respectful commentary, unlike some other people. My name is Henrik Jönsson. And I think that strategic silence is an awful media strategy. Thank you very much for listening.